may be asking questions that somebody else has the mind to ask, but um, they get to them first. Can we get everybody to move up a little bit? One. Oh, just like put the mic here. Sure, I'll stand with it. Oh, okay. This is not here. This is in the way. Yeah, you can just sit outside the house. Okay, so some folks have moved up and some folks have stayed, chose to stay in the back and uh, respect your decision to stay in the back. Once again, along my kako, my name is William Ayla. I'm the chairman of the Department of Land and Natural Resources and really the purpose of the governor's uh, cabinet meeting here in Hilo is to hear from you. So rather than me talk about the department anymore, I will begin addressing questions and answering questions from you folks. Um, I have some staff behind me, Lisa from the DOFA's office over here, and I have Russell Suji from the Land Division uh, Administrator from Oahu. Uh, and I think we have some staff in the audience uh, around if we have questions um, that I can't answer. So, uh, this gentleman approached me first, I'm going to take his question first. Excuse me a second. Um, and his question was, um, he has an idea for a tsunami evacuation center, emergency center in um, ne next to the command man statue. So, why don't you introduce yourself first, so everybody knows who you are. Uh, my name is Gregory Storm, I live here in Hilo. Um, what I propose is something that could potentially save literally hundreds and thousands of lives. And it's something that if it uh, showed to be successful here on the Big Island, it could be propagated in many other islands and low-lying areas around the world. Um, what I see as the problem, even though we have a very good tsunami warning system, if the worst case scenario happens, like happened in India uh, three or four years ago on Christmas Day, ironically, where we have an earthquake that happens in the wrong place, there won't be minutes to evacuate downtown Bayfront. It could be seconds, literally, in that kind of scenario. So the tsunami warnings would, would activate, but you wouldn't have the time for the public systems to properly evacuate some of the people, and the people that could literally be at most risk. So to address this problem, what I propose is an emergency tsunami evacuation shelter. And where I propose it to be built, and the reason I'm wording it this way is I think if it was forwarded properly by the, our uh, representatives and stuff here locally, that we would find that the federal government, either via grants or federal stimulus money, it would cost the local taxpayers zero to build this. Absolutely no money at all. Um, what I propose is next to the uh, King Kamehameha statue, uh, land that already is owned by us, that's uh, run by DLNR and uh, uh, already belongs to the people, behind the Chevron gas station, I propose building uh, a facility, a shelter that would be a tsunami resistant building that would provide instant access and shelter in the event of a catastrophic type emergency. Now, I propose building uh, something that would resemble an old Polynesian longhouse that was suspended 15 or 20 feet in the air, supported by reinforced concrete pylons, okay? It would look like an old Polynesian longhouse, 100 to 200 feet long, with ramps going up on two sides, kind of yin and yang style, coming on both directions. It would look like an old style uh, structure, but in fact, it would be the most safe tsunami resistant structure that exists on Bayfront. The reason I propose to build it 
at that location is because I see a dual purpose for this structure. I see for the most part the structure could be used as an Aloha living cultural center to perpetuate uh, Hawaiian culture, to give people an avenue and a, and a, a space to display the past, King Kamehameha and a, a lot of the great history here, the present, the people that exist here, and to propagate the future. This could uh, have interaction with local school children, universities, etc., etc. Um, the, the location of okay, the location of down there behind the Chevron station is very appropriate because not only do we already own the land and can do something about it, but a lot of times there's choke people down Bayfront, down at the uh, uh, Canoe Hallies and so forth, and if a catastrophic event happened and a warning happened, they could literally run across the street run into this building in a matter of seconds and it could make the difference of life and death to lots of people. And if this idea worked, then this could easily be replicated in other islands, other places, other countries. So when that next Indian uh, Ocean episode happens like it happened there or if it happens here or wherever, then the people will at least have a chance to survive. And it will literally almost cost us nothing to do this. So That's I, my idea. So thank you very much. And what I'll do is I'll give you this card and you can email me. I want to give you this. You can pass it on to does whoever. It, it does. Okay. I just want to explain to Greg that um, the land is DLNRs and the state parks. But because it's a civil defense type structure, I probably have to work with our civil defense folks to see who's, who's most uh, appropriate to, to analyze the, the, the request. But I'm going to take it from you, and then I'll work with uh, General Wong of the State Department of Defense, and we'll, we'll see who's most appropriate there. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, the young lady had her hand up first, and then I'll continue. Oh, hello. I've got a long list, but number one. Okay, can we? Can you ask one, and then we'll go around them, and then we'll come back. Number one concern for me, sir, is hunting grounds that are being taken away by the Big Island hunters. Indigenous crowns that were there for literally two centuries that are now either DL, D and L R land and or private ownership where they're fencing the hunters out and keeping the pigs up above. Can you do something about this? We certainly um, have the responsibility to manage the department's land uh, in a way that is best for the resources and best for the people of Hawaii. So we uh, have been working with some hunters. Um, some hunters will say that's not true. Um, with regards to Mauna Kea, we do have a federal court mandate that we finish the fence and that we shoot all the sheep in that area. And I can tell you right now that I am not going to go to jail. I am going to uh, follow that court mandated uh, court order. Uh, we have been working um, to address some of the Hunter's concerns in terms of we have driven off some of the sheep into other uh, property owners' lands. Okay, so hang on a second. I'll cover that. Uh, we also have a responsibility now that we know that the weather and the rainfall in Hawaii is going to be reduced by anywhere between 15 to 30 percent. We have the responsibility to manage uh, the future rainwater groundwater saturation um, and future drinking water responsibilities for our children and grandchildren with the need to continue hunting, recreational hunting, subsistence hunting. So without specifically talking about a specific area, I can tell you that the department is certainly committed to trying to work with hunters and with the hunting community where it's possible to do so. Where it's possible to increase hunting opportunities, we'll take a look at that. We're not the only agencies that are fencing right now. We have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service fencing. We have the National Parks Service fencing. And we're trying to work with them, especially U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, to take a look at the existing areas that we're fencing, primarily for watershed protection, okay? And include those areas uh, in critical, in the designation of critical habitat, so we don't spread uh, across the islands, uh, multiple agencies, multiple responsibilities 
which will impact hunters, hikers, uh, people that utilize nature, um, I think, in multiple ways. So we are working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to convince them that when we fence off an area, when we remove the pigs or the other ungulates from that area, please consider that as potential critical habitat so that the other areas that they're considering fencing right now, um, they don't do so. So we do have the hunters' uh, concerns in mind, and we are trying our very best to balance everybody's needs. Aloha. Aloha. Chairman, I, uh, my name is Bo Kabui, and I'm with LAIO for 2020 and serve as the executive director. And I also am the director for the villages of LAIO Pua in the homestead community in LAIO Pua And for the people in Hilo, uh, respectfully, I appreciate this opportunity to be here. Uh, thank you for the time for me to pre present uh, uh, our concern. One, I think concern, which is a good segue from the discussion you had from this lady, was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, designation, proposed designation of 18,000 acres in Kona. By regulation, just by stipulating in a paper that they're going to propose this for the uh, preservation of three endangered plants, under regulation, they can just do it once it's, once it's adopted. My concern is, can uh, the proposed legislation also affects a Laiupu Community Center Development Plan? So we are a community-based organization that have raised approximately $10 billion to build a medical clinic, community center, preschool, uh, where we have a phase plan to bring in an aquatic center, a gym, intergenerational daycare facility, and social service facility. The challenge with the Fish and Wildlife proposed designation, in part because if, they, if this thing goes through, it will delay our project. Currently, we have funding sources to make this happen. We are uh, actually seeking a new market tax credit federal, it's a federal program uh, that will allow us to start construction in October. So we're excited about our our development, I've been at it for nine years, and by the sweeping proposal, they just put out October of last year, 2012, they can, we can spend another nine years trying to figure out what we're going to do with critical habitat. I would ask that um, in, in the discussions that, going, that are ongoing now, the negotiations with Laura Neoff from the U.S. Department of Wildlife, is that we look at States Conservation Act in Kwame, Gulf Lake, and other areas. That might satisfy the Department of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, criteria in the dry land forest so that they don't take the planned urban core away from our community. It's critical. We've been working so hard. Uh, given the recent designation, this is the impact it's had. The judiciary has designated a spot just above our, our, our regional park that is also under attack. They've decided to move now after spending thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars for plan. This is unfair. So I urge, I, I look, my question is, and I think this is what I want to find out, can the state deal in help us by setting aside some of these conservation for critical habitat to allow these endangered species to exist. In an urban core, no makes sense. Oho Manawa is waste time, right? We have a critical habitat right across the high school, 26 acre alpaca preserve. Native Hawaiians, that was Native Hawaiian land, was negotiated under Section 7 consultation process through the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we gave up 26 acres for the preservation of alpaca. However, what they don't tell you is that through this process, through this agreement, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands now had to mitigate those measures to protect the alpaca, 
and then into perpetuity manage that facility. So to date, after the last three years, the Department of Hawaiian Homeland has spent over $750,000 for a 26-acre parcel to put in roads, to put in fire breaks, uh, add a water line, and, and the like. My biggest concern is that they added another, they project another $150,000 into perpetuity to manage this facility. So you can see how, how nervous we are in about how this might affect us. Ultimately, it's going to derail our plan. It's already done that. See? Something's happening already. <laughs> So, so the, my, my, the, my question to you is, can the LNR help our Kona community? Can we set aside conservation land to meet, these, meet their objective so that they can exclude those urban core area unit 35 and 36? Okay, so the answer um, I will give you shortly. It's not only Hawaiian homelands. It's uh, HF. FDC lands, it's the right. University of Hawaii lands, QLT, QLT lands. Um, so we are in discussions with. So we are in discussions with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In fact, we are meeting next week to continue the discussions with them. The state is prepared to take a look at putting up lands, right, for critical habitat. Just as the Department of Hawaiian Homelands has spent all that money, though. Once we decide that we're going to give up our lands, we would have the same concerns about managing it in perpetuity because the money all comes from the same pocket, right? Understood. So we, the answer to your question is yes. We are looking at it. We are working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We have the same concerns, and we'd have to figure out who's going to help pay for this continued protection in perpetuity. So we are looking at it, and I think we will come to a solution. Thank you. Hello, Chair. Um, <coughs> my name is Craig Takabini. I'm representing um, the Kalala Lego Industrial Area Association, but also um, representing many of the uh, uh, lessees of the industrial area. I know you're well aware of the situation, uh, the Hilo Industrial Area. Um, the, many, of, <coughs> many of our leases are set to expire um, early 2014. Um, Maybe in 2016, all the way up to 2026. Um, basically, a lot of leases have been staggered. <coughs> um, we met with the governor about uh, two months ago, and uh, you know, because um, some of our lessees had trouble um, putting in their applications for the renewals, um, he said that you know he would work to help streamline um, the process. So. I guess um, we're just kind of wondering, you know, uh, as far as I know, over the last month, I think there's been about three or four applications that have gone in, and we're just wondering, you know, uh, what the status of <coughs> those applications are. Um, one of the big issues we've had also is uh, to extend the lease, um, you know, uh, lessees are going to have to put money in, yeah. And, uh, we just wanted to know if there's going to be some sort of consistency involved in that in determining determining um, what what those improvements are. Um, it'll just help the businesses uh, better plan for the future, and um, we just kind of want to think about it. Okay. So, just for the members of the audience that don't know, so we have lessees in this area that have leases that have gone up to about for a total of 55 years, correct? The legislature passed a bill two or three years ago that allowed for some additional investment into the properties which would allow for an additional 10 years. These leases cannot go more than 65 years. That's a maximum amount of time that a, the lease can go. Legislatively, that's what's the policy. And so we have no jurisdiction over extensions beyond. Um, I don't know in particular with regards to the three applications that have uh, you, you mentioned that have been submitted. Um, I, we can go back and check. Um, in terms of criteria, uh, I guess the statute is vague. Is that the best way to say it? Or is it clear? 
I'm asking Russell, it's pretty general, but you put in uh, to basically amortize uh, the financing or the improvements uh, in the extension to, if it takes amortization, then it takes five, five years. Okay, so based on what Russell said, is based upon the amount of investment and the amount of time it takes to amortize those costs, that is the extent of the, uh, the extent of the length that it can be extended for up to 10 years. So you had a question about criteria, how it would be? I think it's, there's no general criteria. It, it would have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, if you have a, you know, if you have a certain type of building and you want to do a certain amount of improvements to that building, it would be sort of case by case basis. I don't think I could give you a brought up in, like in, in that meeting also that if there's a possibility to maybe take the square footage of the improvements and use some sort of cost basis. Um, and, and you know, I think it's more about um, future um, lessees who want to get extensions already knowing that they're going to have to spend be between X amount to an X amount of yeah. dollars. And it's so only they can properly prepare. And it's only for a maximum of 10 years, yeah. right? Yeah. Prepare their businesses, whether they're gonna, because there, there's some individuals that are looking at, you know, am I gonna do this 10 year extension or am I gonna just, you know, shut down and yeah, for the next couple of years? Just be able to plan for the future. Well, the challenge for us is we can't put it back out until you, know, you guys decide if you're gonna go for the 10 years or not, right? Or if you wanna take the chance of doing the 10 years and then rebidding on it <coughs> for another 65 years, but to make it fair for everyone after 65 years, it should go back out again. So we certainly are open for suggestions if your group wants to get together and come up with, for example, you use a, a formula of square footage, run it by us. We will consider it. If it makes sense and it meets the requirement of the statute and the board thinks it's a good idea because the board is going to have to approve, the land board will have to approve, I don't see why we couldn't consider it. Okay. Suggestion in case of those that have submitted. It will be promulgated and sent to the body in a timely manner. It should be. Can you see that? As they come in, the legal office, <coughs> basically, we'll process the prosecutions. Yeah. Yeah, there, maybe I don't know, I think when I was talking about credit on the side, you mentioned something about bundling. Yeah. Because everyone has to be looked at individually. Yeah. I think, the, I think the idea, Russell, was that some of them didn't, wasn't aware of the process, so kind of get together so that they could. Uh, in help each other figure what the process is, just filling the form, getting the insurance, getting the bank. Would, would it be helpful if we held a meeting with, with all of the folks and explain the process? Can you guys tell us when the next meeting of all of the members are? Great. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So, yeah, we can commit to that, certainly. William. Yes. Last summer, a email went to the U.S. Department of Justice who referred to the U.S. Department of Interior for ADF insurance as my number one priority at Vinos Mobile Power. As of this time, the ADA concerns have not been repaired. My question is, why is the voting division sitting on your own poly and not doing it? I would not categorize it as a city on the report. They are city on the report because it's been quite right some time. I, would catch, I, I have the pictures. If right? I can try to give you an, an, an answer, it's they're also checking with the National Park Service and those folks that govern uh, in terms of what ADA requirements are. So there may be a disagreement as to what the ADA requirements are. This is not with the National Parks. No, no, but many times we follow their guidelines. If you don't understand what I was responsible to help develop that parking lot area, I'm, I'm sure. And it's in there. And one of the biggest things, you see this right here? That is my real okay. I'm not joking. And I want to go fishing, and I, after I fix my boat, I want to make sure that I don't trip, I don't fall down. A lot of times, Glenn, it's. We're not required to bring things up to ADA standards until we do a replacement. 
So I don't know the specifics. This is, this, this is not uh, on a replacement. Okay. This is on holes in the parking lot, right in the area. You don't have striping. And just recently, part of the uh, next to the loading dock, there was a concrete curb that somebody ran through. It was removed by uh, body maintenance. Okay. This is not something new. All I'm asking is take care of the issues because you know you see this little big alley right here. I'm tired of falling down, and this was done in my home. Okay. I don't want to crack my head. I will. Okay, so we have an ADA coordinator. I will personally send him up to Hilo to take a look at that. And he can call me. He knows my number. Okay. Thank you. You are. Hi, right, Chair Isla. Hi, Lisa. I'm calling Sylvester. And I have one question uh, pertaining to hunting. And we have roughly 600,000 acres to hunt on Hawaii Island. Um, why can't we find one acre of state land to put some more Monica sheep? Because currently, Wait, can't we? Or, yeah, why can't we? we? Uh, who says we can't? We've actually moved some sheep off. It's federal land, though, because Monica. The land also, right? Yeah. No, no. Yeah, okay. So we moved some stuff onto. Do you have some landowners that want some? Well, yeah. that's a good question because yeah. we were told by Roger Imoro that we can't. But yet, if you look at one eight chapter one eighty three D, it says that DLNR can okay. so give animals to even private so people if they wanted to, and he strictly told us no. Okay. So maybe and we need to rethink that. Okay. If you can provide me with some landowners, the closer the better. Okay. I remember the big one calling me up one night, telling me they were going to shoot sheep up on my. Yeah, we, we are going to. If we want, we can go up there and get it. The salvage, correct. I will feed that to my dog. Okay. And it blew them all in the stomach. And mother of the sheep with the babies hanging out of the stomach. Let me see you give You guys talk about cruelty. That cannot be a cruelty. Well, Shoot them off the helicopters. Man. Shoot them off the helicopters is something that we're required to do. Yeah, because the bull okay. crap up on the hill. Well, a federal judge has ordered me to do it. So, kill all kids. <laughs> Hang on. That's the pharmacies. You know what? I'm a hunter. Born and raised on hunter. I raised my family on hunter. I fed a lot of families. And okay. you guys can try to stop us? Try. Okay. Well, you're welcome to have the disagreement. You know, it's I'm going to say if you can provide me with landowners, we'll consider it. Okay. All right. What about Thank actual you. state land, though, itself? I mean, we have 600,000 acres, and it seems, and I know, you know, I understand all the endangered species, threatened endangered species, and all that. We cannot but take sheep. There's, there's areas, areas that actually have, species. like Puawa and stuff, but because it's stuck in these habitat conservation plans and things like that, that there's areas in there, thousands of acres that could be used for game, but these things are sitting idle. Well, and they have sensitive areas in there that can be fed. They conservation plans for a reason, right? Because they're mitigation for something that occurred someplace else. So I cannot take sheep and put them where they're threatened and endangered species. I would be violating the federal law by doing that. If you can find some land that is publicly or privately owned, but there is that, there, that it, you know you're talking 30, 40 thousand acre areas, and eight thousand is identified with threatened and endangered species, and the rest is there's some archaeological sites, and the rest is just fountain grass, and there's almost no habitat. Oh, wow. so those lots areas could be utilized for hunting. Lots, there's lots of sheep there already too, right? Puvaba. Yeah, but they're not coming to hunting problems where you gotta walk 12 miles to get to the place and because the access is open for gate is closed. archery and. Those kinds of things, right? But so very, very hard to get in. So I, I admit that we can improve hunting access to those areas. But if you can provide me, other than Puwawa, because I want to take a look at the threatened and endangered species too. So Puan Hulu. Puan Hulu. Next door. Provide Big us. areas, 30,000 acre areas. So okay. Potential is there for game management. Okay, so provide us with the input and we'll take a look at it. Okay. I'll certainly consider it. We'll run it past. A big island staff. Okay. Oh, wait. Let me go to. Yeah, I yeah. want. I do have another question. Okay, let me try to go okay. to other folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, Director. My name is Tracy Wicker, and I'm a professor here in the Science Department at Shiro. And I'm here today with um, Sharon Ziegler Chong and Jerry Chang. And we at the university are looking at ways to work with the community and to help take care of Hilo Bay. And an opportunity has uh, come our way. Uh, NOAA is looking to designate a national estuarine research reserve site in the state. 
and we um, were strongly encouraged by Noah to um, nominate a site. Um, and we nominated Hilo Bay, and we've gone into uh, phase two. So uh, Hilo Bay and Kaiowe Bay are being considered for this designation um, to help her, uh, protect and preserve our resources for the community. Um, and we're looking for partners to help work with us um, as we move forward in this process. And the uh, agency that is um, leading the, the process is uh, CZM, so I will make sure that uh, the, the folks that run CZM. Uh, yeah, we've been working with them. Okay. So thank you for putting together a, uh, a proposal. Hilo Bay, like Kanye Bay. Hilo Bay, like Kanye Bay, is, are important to uh, yeah, the folks that live there. So mm -hmm. maybe we can have hope. I don't know. Well, and if that doesn't talk about it, I think it's the more important message is that um, I, I have been responsible for running, for running Ocean Day for many years with a lot of my um, my colleagues, and we're just really looking at what are those what are those activities and things as a community we really can do in Hilo Bay together. We're doing a lot of things, so always kind of think of resources that we can help um, add to the things that the community needs to and that are important in the day. It's such a focal point for our whole community. So really okay, so if anybody in the audience is interested in in Hilo Bay and projects involved in improving Hilo Bay, then University of Hawaii at Manoa is. I, just, I got one Hilo. quick question Hilo. about. <laughs> Not Manoa, Hilo. Hilo. Oh, <laughs> centric, you caught me. Yeah. Actually, I'm Waianae centric, not even Oahu centric. I got one quick question for the effort you're trying to make there, and, it, and I guess the LNR controls this, but I'm not sure. But from what I've heard, a lot of people speculate over years. Uh, the real crux of cleaning up Hilo Bay is to improve the flow of water. So unless you can, unless you can, yeah, increase the flow of water through the break wall, add some breaks in the break wall or something, you're fighting an uphill battle that'll be very difficult. You got to restore it back to the Aina. So I don't know whose responsibility the break wall is, but you can a protect Hilo with a break wall and at the same time make it function better and have better water flow. What room is that the bay. Komodo in? Department of Transportation? <laughs> <laughs> They're in charge of that break wall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can tell you that the engineering that would have to go to get the Army Corps of Engineers to prove something like that would, would cost a lot of money. And I'd say it's impossible. It would take a, a huge effort and cost a lot of money to do that. So, yes, sir. My name is Byron Yogi, Byron. private citizen. Uh, I like this meeting, but my question to you is, how often are you going to have meetings like this, number one? Number two, um, I lived on Oahu for a number of years, came back home. Can you have more meetings and a planning and uh, directional stages so we don't have to just react to what you guys are doing on Oahu? Because we're the breadbasket of the state like certain valleys in California are for the state. Can you treat us more of that way as part of what the science is, part of the whole? And try to come this way and work with the people here to have a lot more input. Not just the big landowners, but a lot of the people to give their input for okay. I can't, the meeting. I can't speak for the governor. This is the governor's cabinet meeting, so he gets to decide how many times he wants to come out. I can tell you that the Department of Land and Natural Resources, we try to come out to communities as often as possible when we, when we take actions. I have a huge department, so any conservation lands, OCCL has to come out. Any water commission, uh, anything that has to do with water, water commission folks have to come out. Anything that has to do with the 1.3 million acres of unencumbered state lands, the land division would have to come out. And I have, that's three of 13 divisions. So we try as much as possible to come out. Um, we put as much information on our website as possible. As you know, as you know, just as expensive it is for you to travel to Oahu, it's just as expensive for me to send staff uh, to the neighbor islands. And you're just one of several neighbor islands that are asking for the same thing. So I have to take a look at what my budget allows me to do. I think you guys need to do more of that because on this island, the county tries to do it on both sides of the island and different things to make the island stronger. So and maybe you guys can well do more efforts to do that. We'll here. try as best as we can within the budget restraints that I have. 
Okay, I don't, I don't have one item of debt. I More understand than, that. I understand. But well, we're the ones that will provide the food. Okay. <laughs> I, I agree with you. The plan is for the big island to become the bread basket for the state of Hawaii. I wouldn't agree with you that you're there now because there's a lot of food that's produced on the water. But in the future, yes. We will try to make it so that all of the islands are as self-sufficient as possible. You have the potential because of energy. You have the potential because of rainfall. You have the potential because your island is twice as big as all the other islands put together to be the bread basket. So I agree. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad to see you. I'm going to leave very well. At least I'm going on a different path. Who is watching the radiation in the waters around the water? The radiation in the waters of the state of Hawaii would be the responsibility of the Department of Health. Health. So you're talking about aquifers? No. Uh, no. Drinking water and salt water. So I can tell you if, if you're concerned about I'm Fukushima. I'm concerned about drinking water. You're okay. saying okay. we're going to lose rainfall and all this. Our waterlands sits on salt water. Correct. The water if the radiation were above a certain level that yeah. is determined to be a health, if it's, then, then nobody can drink it. We have to go to another place where it's not uh, contaminated to that point, and, or we'd have to look at ways to treat it to be look below a certain level. Again, that would be the Department of Health's oh. determination to do that. Where do you think we're getting the radiation from? Japan. So I can tell you that, I can tell you that every piece of Japanese marine debris, large object that we found, we've had tested by the Department of Health. And absolutely none of those boats, floats, uh, containers, pieces of netting that we can trace back to Japan in that area has ever registered anything above normal or above background level. Well, my concern is nobody in the state of Hawaii talking about not the debris, the radiation that the water has been dumped into the Pacific Ocean. I even have a map that shows how the flow is coming through. There's, there's lots of folks that have lots of maps out there. No, but what I've read <coughs> through the internet saying that a thousand and twelve <coughs> the birth rate for a lot of young children in thyroid problems. One. My daughter-in-law is pregnant, they told her, can I eat tuna? And so what was her record? No. Tuna fishermen are now saying they find a tumor in fish that they never saw. So I thought, you know, I don't want to hear it, I want to see things. I, I fished for 30 years, and well before the Fukushima accident, we've been noticing that fish had tumors in the tumor. Yeah. So well before that. So you would your department have a my department does not do that. Well, we don't do the health. We do <coughs> the management of the species. But any health-related concerns would be the Department of Health. So I would go have somebody ask Loretta to give you the answer on that one, because that's their kuleana, to determine those questions about radiation and any of those answers like that. Okay. I don't mean to sidestep you, and, but we, we have our areas of expertise, and that's their area of expertise. Let me, let me go her, and then I'll come to you. Okay? Yeah, I want to ask a question about Pohuki. Oh, Pohuki is a county park. The fishermen launch off Pohuki. Yeah, this is And what about to go? I have a fisherman coming with a bent prop. And he has a bent prop because he tried to avoid the swimmers in the area. And because of the way they have to come in, they have to avoid the swimmers. I need to return. I, mean, yeah, I know we've had discussion for, oh, since I've been there, I've, I've been with the other for 14 years. Is there a way to have a discussion between the county? Because now the park is really, really nice. So there's a lot more swimmers in the path of the boat come in, lots come in out. So is there a way to get a discussion between the county, um, the LNR, and the community? So that would be the councilmen, get their community discussion to maybe have a safer area for the swimmers to go and not in the path of the fishermen because a lot of them are having their boats damaged or propellers damaged 
And I know even though we have an, find another area, tumors are still going there. So but Senator Ruderman and I have been having that discussion and we have to bring in the county because the county, probably the, the, the easiest way to make it safe for the majority of the people down there is to take some of the city and county fast lands, lands that are above the high water mark, excavate them and then cut an opening into the ocean to let water in. Okay? That will take Army Corps of Engineers permits. That will take financing. And that will get many of the people, especially the young Keiki, to go swim in that area if the county agrees to it. It's not gonna get everybody because you have all you always have the people that want to jump off the pier, which is signed and which is everybody knows illegal, but I, I can't have Doki officers down there twenty four seven evicting the swimmers from the launch room. It's just an accident. Unfortunately, you know, it's like if a person chooses to put themselves in a dangerous situation and they get hurt, they chose themselves to get into that situation. If a parent allows their children to be in a dangerous situation and they get hurt, the parent bears that responsibility. It's hard for the fishermen to always have I understand. So I, we've been in discussions, uh, Senator Ruderman and I, we've come to the conclusion that the only thing that makes sense is to create a swimming area out of the park land, we've got to go talk to Billy and get Billy to agree. Then somebody's got to go to the legislature, get the money appropriated, go through the permitting process, go through the engineering process, and then finally construct it. That's, I knew that question was coming. <laughs> okay, back there. Hi, I'm Alana. My name is Terry. Hello, Terry. I wanted to ask a question, and, and that question was, you know, just recently I found out that NARS had appointed um, an expert to to make decisions for um, our traditional customary practices. And I was just wondering if you could tell me that person's name, and then have a reason, and then I have more things to say. Okay, so I don't think NARS appoints, appoints an expert. NARS, the law was changed last year, so that at least one of the NARS um, commission members would have some experience in traditional customary practice. So, so they're not experts. And the law never said they had to be experts because I would be very careful about calling anybody an expert in traditional customary okay, practices. In light of that, um, to decide uh, traditional customary practices. She doesn't decide traditional well, customary practices. To decide in regards to what is very important to our people, because we are subsistence gatherers, you know, it, it, it is someone that should know the importance of ceremony and also as a religion. And so that's why I say expert, and that is something that the law requires to understand. Because when you put it in light of a religion, it should be someone that practices. Is and, and so what I'm saying is that I would like to know the person's name. And if that person could address important issues for our white people, and is there a process that our white people can be a part of the process? And because I think for years, our people have had no voice to discuss things that are very important. We are the most culture. And in every environmental assessment, environmental impact statement, there's only one culture that you address, and that is our Hawaiian culture. Because it is addressed in law, in our state constitution, Article 12, Section 7, and in NAGPRA, it is the only culture that needs to, to, to be addressed as to how that culture is being impacted. And that's why I'm, I'm asking, you know, is there in the process a way that your person in NARS um, you know, because it's important to me, there are designated areas that were seated lands, private lands, also lands that are, are open for public. And so I'd like to just ask if there's some way that our people who are subsistence gatherers, who were taught the traditions in years, to have a voice and meet that group.
group of people that make decisions, as well as BLNR, the Board of Land and Natural Resources. They had, I understand, someone that makes decisions in, in, in permits to do certain things. And that's why I'm saying, is there a process that our people can have a meeting or, or you know, where we can publicly have every Hawaiian in the state an opportunity to hear every issue that concerns our people. And because I'm just saying that it is not capital. And as we go through years, I'm a traditional customer and practitioner. I was taught by my father to be able to and how to take care of our resources. And I know that you talk about coexisting with scientists. What I mean, what does it mean to coexist with scientists, to coexist with conservationists? When it's skewed on the on the science side because they probably have a PhD. And when you have a hunter that addressed you earlier about subsistence gathering and our pigs that are food that is being called injurious. Injurious because they're saying that it is not part of our culture to have a pig. I can prove to you that my family, in years, hundreds of years, used the pig for food and also used the pig, not in on it, I'm not going to call it that, I'm going to call it claw, for ceremony. I can prove to you that my family has used that as a practice of religion. And that, to me, is by law very important for, our, for, for you to recognize and, and that's what I'm saying. Is there a way that you can contact me so that I can contact the rest of the Hawaiians in our state of Hawaii so that we can have a voice to save something that is our food and resource? So let me answer your question. Yes. Her name is Ula Leah Woodside. I'm sorry? Ula Leah Woodside. And is there a way that I can contact her or he? Does she have a, an email on that? So her information may not be on the website as of yet because she's so new, but we'll get it up there. Um, if you, I'm gonna get my card. I will, I will ask her if she can, if you can contact her uh, outside of the uh, the public process because okay, they give up their time. She's not an expert, and I'm sure she would be the first one to say she's not an expert. Um, she's chosen for her understanding of some traditional customary practices. Sam Gan is the person on the land board currently who is um, chosen because he has skills with regards to traditional customary practice. He doesn't make the decision for the land board on traditional customary practices. He gives advice, board members ask him about what are traditional customary practices, this permits that going, that's going forward, how does it impact traditional customary practices. So, but the board, or in this case, the commission, makes the decision. It's not the individual makes the decision on traditional customary uh, practices. You referring to the In some cases, it's the Board of Land and Natural Resources. In some cases, it's the NARS Commission. In some cases, it could be the Water Commission. Uh, so we have lots of boards and commissions. It could be the Burial Council. It could be any one of those. So. I can't tell you right now that I can put you on everybody's list. The normal practice for anyone wishing to participate in all of these public processes is to go to the website, submit your name and say, I want to be contacted anytime there's a meeting, anytime there's a, a proposed rule change, and then hopefully you'll get on the list that gets contacted. And I will be happy to give you my card. Can you repeat that name one more time? Right? Ula Lea Woodside. Woodside? Woodside. I believe it's W-O-O-D-S-I-D-E? Yeah, S-I-D-E. Yeah. S-I-D-E. Yes. Yeah. Sam. Sorry? Sam Gone. Sam, Sam Gone. Can you spell that last name? G-O-N, the third. I have one more question, and then I'll say. In regards to that criteria that you have to have it someone that makes a decision on traditional customary practices. They don't make the decision, they have for advice. Who, who, who comes up with the the, in this in this case, the legislature did. So that can be changed too by people and you know pushing legislative bills. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome.
Okay. Director, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to have to wrap this up in less than five minutes. So if you can take your last and then wrap it up. Thank you. Hey, you My name is Ian Um I heard you reference um, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the wall and stuff. Uh, if you open the Native Species Act, the Native Species Act specifically says critical habitats are not include the entire geographical range or historical habitat, uh, is historical range of the species. The Native Species Act is pretty much species specific. Okay? Uh, you need permits to move um, species along. Okay? No matter who you are, you need President Barack Obama to move an Indian species, you do need permits. Okay? The questions are if the Indian species is the Endangered Species Act says what it says it says. Why doesn't the state of Hawaii tell the Fish and Wildlife Service that they cannot take the entire geographical area for its species? Okay. Um, you know, like the, the last one the brother was saying, um, out there for hours, so many species, uh, that you want like 19,000 acres? That is ridiculous. That is the entire geographical area. Um, I do know that the uh, Critical habitat it extends to almost all of the sea events, all the hunting areas, uh, not areas of the Okay, they just told me to replace. The state of Hawaii, if I don't have enough resources, that is my cost time. Just let the state of uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, kind of like have jurisdiction over everything. Um, also, the mount seals that were brought here by uh, your market. Okay. There were no permits issued to bring the monk seals to the main Hawaiian islands. And this was uh, also said by uh, the heads of law uh, at our, our monk seal meeting. Why hasn't the state of Hawaii stepped forward again and uh, enforced the law upon those that have broken the law? Not only were there no permits issued, but there's also no EIS done. Uh, no public comment made. Uh, you know, so uh, I would like to ask what is the department going to do about this? Well, there's, there's such a thing called federal preemption. And federal preemption. So, you know, so with regards to the Monsell Marine Mammal Protection Act, there's such a thing as federal preemption. So we have been through case law, uh, for example, we have been told by judges that with regards to the Marine Mammal Protection Act and things covered under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, that the federal government, because Congress so choose to exempt, exempt the federal government, that we are preempted from passing any laws that would be counter to the federal laws regarding the Marine Mammals. So that's, that's the monks here. Well, I cannot stop the federal government from giving themselves a permit to move marine mammals around. The federal government did not give themselves a permit. Well, I, I don't know. I can take a look into that. Yeah, please do. This was by Bill Gilmartin. Do you know about what time frame this was? Uh, and, uh, okay. also, well, with regard to the threatened and endangered species, um, again, there's there's such a thing as federal preemption. So I'd have to take a look at which species you're talking about. It's not essentially uh, the majority of the species are endangered species. They have critical habitat established. Crit critical habitat is something that the federal government has the authority to, to designate. Okay. They can designate it on state lands, they can designate it on private lands, they can designate it anywhere that they see fit. Um, that's why we're trying to work with them, see, we're already fencing areas off in which hunters are angry with us. Let's take a look at those areas for threatened and endangered species so we don't have these pocket fences all over the place. Okay, I heard that. 
I can't, I can't speak for the guys that were here in the 1980s. Yeah. I can only speak for us. Can, can we hold it quiet? But that doesn't stop them from designating. And when they designate it, I'd have to look at that. <laughs> but here's what they can do. They can go, if you don't cooperate, you're not going to get any federal money. Yeah, exactly. Well, I have to take a look at what would the impact be on the budget of the department, what would it be on the protection that the, the federal funds allows us to do, and then balance that with what the liabilities are for accepting the federal funds. Oh, no, I, I agree. I gotta look at the impact on balancing tomorrow's water needs with your guys' desire to continue to hunt. That's what I gotta do. We have to wind up, so if you could just summarize. Mark? Overall, we're going to become drier. They're going to be higher intensive storms, but overall, we're going to be drier. All the models are showing that. USGS models, universal flight models, all those models are showing that. It's a little confusing. We're going to have higher and harder storms but they're going to be so short that in the overall period, it's going to be 30, 15 to 30 percent less rainfall in the state of Hawaii. Okay. I got to finish. Could you give Uncle over Thank you. I, I, I really, I really can. I'm pressed on time. We're going to have everyone come. We're going to have the cabinet members come back in to address you. And wait for about five minutes to the cabinet members to get here. We'll get loud. People will start walking in. So it's okay. Can I have one second? Okay, so uh, whoever. Hang on, hang on. Whoever, whoever, whoever handed me this, hang on, just one at a time. So whoever handed me this, I'll tell you right now. If you want to try and hold the state personally liable, you're welcome to do so. We need okay. new signs down there, sir. You're welcome to do so. Anybody that puts themselves in a dangerous situation and knows it's a dangerous situation, we doesn't need belong. new signs, okay. sir. Okay. Right. Okay. 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 Did he get me? Did he get me? Well, the state has just been served their eviction papers. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for your patience.
and uh, we had a, a very extensive uh, dialogue and conversation about their hopes and dreams, uh, their desires, and their and their uh, their, de their determination uh, to uh, be the next generation of, of, of leadership and, and uh, participation on, on the Big Island. They're an extraordinary group of, of young people. Uh, uh, I was with uh, Renee Shindo. I'm sure some of you know her at, uh, at Hilo and at Waikia down at Tanabe. Uh, it is individuals like Ms. Tanabe and, and Ms. Shindo that uh, are the heart and soul of, of what we talked about over there, it, it, which was, uh, uh, among other things, how do you apply the Aloha spirit to your everyday life? And whether it gives you the kind of foundation for for your future and, and, and how it will will affect you in the most positive way. Uh, uh, it, it reminded me, and as I said to them, about the, 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 the most important people in your life are those that give you the, the sense of direction and your sense of self that you may not be able to discover entirely on your own. That's really what we're trying to do here. Uh, we recognize that we have our shortcomings and uh, uh, and, and that our uh, efforts may not satisfy everybody in as uh, quick a time as, as we would like. But from a, an institutional point of view, which is really, um, in a sense, what the government provides, you can't institutionalize a move. You can't make a good policy out of fashion. Uh, you have to have uh, a sense of, of longevity and a solid grounding. Uh, in uh, values uh, in order to try and figure out how to effectuate the best possible policy. I assure you that every observation that was made tonight, every suggestion that was made tonight, every inquiry that opened up the possibility of perhaps going in another direction or a different direction or cause a, 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 or cause a, a, re, a sense of reflection to take place as to whether we're on the right track, I assure you uh, that all of that, uh, all of those uh, shared uh, intimacies, because that's what this is, um, are, are respected and will be taken fully uh, into account. So we're very, very, I'm very, very happy that I had the opportunity, especially to be with these wonderful uh, young people. Uh, and I uh, am especially grateful uh, I, that uh, those of us who have had this sense of responsibility, now, not even a sense of it, but actually had the responsibility over the years now, uh, have this uh, uh, wonderful new generation to look at. Um, I see uh, by way of complete coincidence, and now that I mentioned the young people and I'm talking about some of I see that, that Hawaii County's uh, uh, Senior <coughs> Citizen of the Year is here, and I think Shirley, And, and her lovely husband, George, is there. <laughs> there you go. Good and surely I can tell you, you'd be very proud of these young people at Hilo and YK that, uh, that were here this evening uh, to, to share their, their sense of what the future is all about. So thank you uh, very, very much uh, for uh, all of your uh, Manalo tonight, all of the, all of, all of the uh, intelligence and perspective and reflection that you've shared with us this evening, it will be reciprocated, I can assure you, and uh, we'll do our level best to be responsible and responsive. Thank you very, very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our Governor's Cabinet in your community. Please pick up after yourself and show up on your way out. And can you please give one more round of applause to Governor Abercrombie?